I be on social media sometime, and people have heard me talk about my relationship with Tupac. And people have heard me talk about my relationship with Stretch, who was Randy Walker, who was one of Tupac's best friends. Actually, they were like brothers. And recently, I became, I got attacked. And I'm going to tell you why I got attacked. I was attacked on social media by what I call Tupac stands and super fans. Um, and this is because Stretch, uh, who was Tupac's, one of Tupac's closest friends, his his memory and his legacy was dirt was kicked on it by some inmate that claimed that Stretch was in cahoots with Jimmy Hinchman to set Tupac up for the quad shooting in 1994. So all of a sudden in my DMs, I'm starting to get pictures of Stretch and Tupac together with his face X'd out. Your man is a rat, bitch. Fuck your man. And the guy's not here to defend himself. And for a little bit of it, y'all, I was arguing with people like an idiot. And, you know, we all sometimes go with that first reaction of what we feel. And we argue with people. Um, then I just stopped. I just, I I would question certain people about their age. How old are you? Well, I'm 22, 23. 1994, you wasn't even around. So you don't know what happened. You don't know what transpired. You don't know what could have happened. You don't know what transpired. And then it got to a point where I became so, so full of anger and rage about the selling of my friend's name that I called his brother Madge. And Madge told me that he was doing an interview with Infomons, and it's on YouTube right now. Stretch's brother Madge speaks out about Tupac. And there's something that I think that all of y'all should listen to. And you also always have to understand the 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 uh the magnitude of their relationship, the relationship itself, and you can't listen to everything that somebody says about somebody else and take it as gospel. And that's what a lot of a lot of people do. You take it as gospel. Now, when we were, when Tupac was shooting Juice, and him and Stretch started running around with each other, because I was on the set of Juice, because I had a minuscule part in Juice. Um they were they 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 were really, 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 really tight friends. All right, and this inmate who has spread all these lies about Stretch taking part in setting Tupac up in the quad shooting, was lying. Straight up factual. He's trying to sell a book. So he's lying. So he's making up shit. And I know that before Tupac died, when Tupac started running with Shug, Tupac had certain things to say about a lot of people. He had certain things to say about Biggie. He had certain things to say about Junior Mafia. He had certain things to say about Little C's. He had certain things to say about a lot of shit. He had certain things to say about Stretch. He had certain things to say about <laughs> shit. Pretty much Nas, Jay-Z, Mob D, pretty much anybody who he felt at that time he had a problem with. But there was a Tupac that generally y'all don't know because you were too young. You wasn't there. Okay, Tupac was the kind of person that if he was going to say something, he was going to say it, and then he would deal with the consequences later, whether he was right or wrong. He was just a human being. He made mistakes. You guys forget that when Tupac was shot in 1994, there was Zay, Pac, Stretch, and Nichols. Pac was not the only person that got shot. Nichols was shot too. Nichols was part of a crew called the Young Guns. The Young Guns was my homies, and I'm going to tell you how I met the Young Guns. If there was one, I have actually have Young Guns tattooed to my arm right now. If there was a lame motherfucker in the Young Guns, if there was a lame person in the Young Guns, that person would have been me. I was the lamest dude out of all of them dudes because I wasn't an original Young Gun. They were already together together. As a crew, drug dealing young motherfuckers from Queens, New York. I'm not talking about the young guns from Mount Vernon. That's a different crew. That was up there where Heavy and them was. I'm talking about the young guns from Springfield, Hollis, Jamaica, 
that area, north side of Queens. You listen to Nori, Nori shout him out. You listen to you listen to Biggie, Biggie shout stretch out. They were young, gun busting fucking drug dealers. How I got involved with them is they be, they decided that they wanted to rap. Stretch, his brother Madge, Kalo was the DJ, Live Squad. They decided that they wanted to rap, and they came to me. Me and my partner, Mark and Sha, had a deal with Russell Simmons, RAL Associated Labels. We had No Face Records. Y'all, y'all didn't know this shit about me. I had my own record label through No Face Records. Stretch knew that I was in that neighborhood. Madge knew that I was in that neighborhood. They knew where I lived. They knew my sister. They knew I wasn't that far away from them. So they came around to me with their demo tape. I liked it. I liked what they was talking about. I helped them with their concepts a little bit. And I took their demo tape, played it for Queen Latifah. Queen Latifah hooked me up with Monica Lynch from Tommy Boy. Tommy Boy loved it, signed them to Tommy Boy Records. At the time, Ice-T and them was doing their thing with Body Count. So when the cop killer shit came out and all of the shit came out about it, they got dropped from Tommy Boy because they made Tommy Boy, which is a subsidiary, look the word up, subsidiary of Warner Brothers, dropped anybody that had anything to say about shooting cops in their video. In their song, Murderer, they have a scene in a long-form video, which you can find on YouTube right now, Live Squad, Heartless Murderer long-form video, gets called Game of Survival, where they kill a cop. So they got dropped. At the same time, they were running with Tupac. If you go back and look at Tupac's first album, Strictly For My Niggas, if you look at Holla, you know, Holla If You Hear Me, that was produced by Stretch and Madge in the live squad. Holla If You Hear Me was produced by them. This is how close these dudes were. This is how they ran together. This is how Pac used to be at my mom's house in Queens. This is the way Pac used to be around our way in Queens all the time. Like I said, these dudes, the live squad dudes, were known. They wasn't no pussy-ass niggas, okay? If anybody was a lame nigga in that group, that was me. I was 10 years older than these dudes. I'm on MTV. I got my own record label. I'm not fucking shooting at niggas and doing shit like that. No, I'm not doing that shit no more. I've been out of that shit. These was not niggas that you played around with. So when Nichols got shot and nobody claimed to know what happened and nobody took when Nichols got shot and Pac got shot, it was like one of they niggas got shot. Nichols was part of the Young Guns. Pac was part of the YGs before he got down with Suge when he got locked up. So they took this shit personally. They didn't take this like, oh, man, Pac got shot. Let's chill out. We don't know what to do. They took it as, yo, niggas shot my niggas. We bodying somebody. Y'all don't seem to, to feel me. This is why I get so frustrated when we talk about this is because these was not, Stretch wasn't no fuck boy. I'm telling you right now. I remember these niggas got in some beef. They shot some shit up. And they gave me the AK to hide. I kept that shit in my mom's basement for a long fucking time. My mother didn't even know it was down there. Because my mother had like a utility room back there. And I stashed the AK back there. She never knew the fucking gun was in the house. Never knew that I had an AK-47 in the house. I used to stash this shit for them all the time. This is not a fuck nigga y'all talking about. This is not a nigga. This is not a pretend nigga. This is not that. Niggas in New York knew him, loved him, and respected that nigga because they knew what kind of damage he can inflict on a motherfucker by just saying a word. There was The Young Guns was a gang of little drug-dealing, gun-busting niggas. This is not, I'm not joking. When I ran with them, I was the lame nigga because I wasn't doing all of that. I'm the big homie. I'm the nigga that they looking up to. I'm a nigga that they know is from their neighborhood that did a little dirt back in the days, but came up out of that shit because of your TV raps and my music and my band and everything else that I was doing. Stretch was the most loyal motherfucker I ever met in my life. That was my dude. I got this dude's name tattooed to my arm. Him and Pac was like brothers, dude. Nichols got shot. The word went out that this shit was getting ready to go down and niggas got petrified because they knew they knew that they was going to war. So when the word came out, and I know y'all heard this, all the real Tupac fans that Stretch told Tupac, Jimmy Hinchman said he got money for war. It's true because Jimmy called his house and told him, I hear the young guns is ready to get out here and tear this shit up about 
Pac getting shot. Not about Pac getting shot. It was more about Nichols getting shot, dude. That's what it was about, y'all. This is what I'm telling y'all. You got to listen to the info miles when my man Majesty break the whole story down. Nichols got hit. Somebody was going to pay for this. And then Jimmy told, Str Jimmy told Stretch, yo, I got money for war. When you go into war with niggas, you got to have bread. You know why? Because niggas will run up in your house and shoot and kill your moms. You got to move your moms. You got to relocate your kids. You got to relocate your girl. You got to do a lot of shit. And at the time, niggas ain't really had no money like that. Niggas didn't come to me and say, Ed, we getting ready to go to war. We need some bread. They kept me away from that kind of shit. Because I would have gave them the bread. Because I had bread too. I would have gave him some bread. But you got to relocate your moms. You got to relocate your baby mother. You got, And it's all of these niggas. Because when niggas is going to war, they murdering, every, they murdering niggas, man. And the niggas getting murdered, they murdering back. Everybody's in harm's way. Everybody's associated is in harm's way. And when Nichols got shot in that studio in Quad, they took that shit personally. Now, I need y'all to use some common sense. This is real talk. And you can listen to the info minds and match touches on this shit too. When Pac came to town, I wasn't always around all the time because like I said, I was on MTV. I was doing my thing. I was running a label. I'm back and forth with Tommy Boy about the live squad. We shooting videos. We doing all kind of shit. So they ran with Pac because they was always in the studio. Every now and then I'd stop by the studio, fuck with them a little bit, and then I'd be on my way. When Pac came to town, they moved with what Pac was doing. If Pac was going uptown to do a special Kid Capri freestyle or Ron G freestyle, they moved up there. If Pac was doing this or Pac was doing that, it was all, it was no itinerary. Y'all seem to think that Pac going to the quad studios that night was part of an itinerary. So Stretch knew exactly where he was going, how they was moving. We talking 1994, nigga. I was the only nigga I knew out of all of them niggas that even had a cell phone in 94. So when is all this back and forth with Jimmy to set Pac up in the studio? When is, how is that possible? When they ain't even know what the fuck they was doing. Pac told them we going to quad because Jimmy giving me some bread to jump on this little Sean joint. That's how they knew Pac was coming to the studio. That's how they knew. Listen to the Info Minds joint that my man Madge did. It's on YouTube right now. And listen to, listen to niggas talk about how when Nichols got shot, him and E Money Bags, God rest his soul. It's a whole nother story altogether about E Money Bags getting killed. How E Money Bags, they was the only niggas that could go see Pac up, locked up north on Rikers Island. Well, he didn't go all the way up north. He went to the island in the city, in New York City. They the only ones that could go see him because they the only niggas that had ID. I used to ride with these niggas all the time. Niggas had no driver's license. We talking about back in the days when the cops pulled you over, they would just give you a ticket for not having a license. The niggas drive, Stretch drove that MPV all over fucking New York. He ain't had no license. He had no ID. He had no passport or nothing. They're supposed to be going overseas with Pac. They didn't even have a passport. So they couldn't go visit nobody in Rikers Island because they had no fucking ID. So E Money Bags goes up there. Nichols goes up there and they tell Pac, yo, you remember when the niggas spun after they laid us down? They spun because season them was coming out of the elevator. To see what was going on with us? You remember? And Pac was like, damn, son, no word. It's like, yeah. He said, damn, I just did an ill interview with Vibe. Blaming Biggie. Biggie is the nigga that stashed the guns that Pac had on him. Biggie's the nigga that walked the guns out of the fuck. Y'all don't hear me, man. But y'all listening to what other niggas say to y'all about something that the niggas wasn't even involved in, yo. And you sullying and you throwing dirt on my nigga's name. You sliding in my DMs talking shit about my nigga. I know this nigga, dog. This is not how stretch. And what did he have to gain? He was already a street nigga. This nigga was already connected. He stopped selling drugs. If he wanted to go back to selling drugs, he didn't have to fucking get it from Jimmy. He had his own shit. He had to get it from Jack. Haitian Jack, he had his own shit, dude. He had his own connects in the street. They used to be for Supreme and them from 40 Projects because they was making so much money on, on our side. Supreme and them wanted to get their territory. I was with them niggas one night. They got in the beef with my man Bimmy, and Bimmy is my man right now. Bimmy's Waka Flocka's uncle, Deb Anthony's brother. 
Joe's brother, the Antonys, strong off of Farmers Boulevard. These are not fuck-ass pussy people I'm talking about. These are strong people in their respective neighborhoods. I remember they got in the beef with Bimmy. Guns came out the fucking roller skate rink. Nigga, I'm Lottie Dottie, and I'm doing my one-two around the roller rink. I'm chilling, you know. Ah, I'm fucked up. I'm gonna drink a fifth of night train and shit. Smoke the bag. We chilling. Niggas is wilding in the skate rink. Funk Master Flex on the wheels of steel from Hot 97 New York. These niggas is wilding. Fighting farmers, niggas. Guns come out in the skating rink, my nigga. These are not niggas that you can lightly talk about, and it breaks my heart because a dead man can't defend himself. And at first, niggas was going to leave it alone. And if you listen to the Info Minds whole thing that they did with Madge, you even hear a nigga named Hamo jump on. I have never heard Hamo talk about shit. Hamo was one of the most dangerous little motherfuckers I ever met in my life. There's a reason why they called this nigga Hamo. Hamo was short for homicide. There's a reason. He was quiet. He reminded me. Hamo always reminded me of Nas, but he didn't rap. You know how Nas is laid back and shit. Nas don't say much. Nas will laugh a little bit. Hamo was like that. Hamo was, every time I was around Hamo, after I got to know him for, for after a while, I felt safe being around him because I knew he was my man. I knew he knew what, what I was, who I was, what I was doing in the business, and he knew that I was helping his mans and them get out of the business, and we taking the whole fucking live squad, young gun crew with us. He already knew that. But niggas that knew how my wife in the street was petrified. This, this nigga's not even 5'9", Doug. I'm telling you, I don't know how tall homo, gam, Gambino, all of the niggas, everybody, generals, nigga, niggas was respected. These are not grown men. We're talking 25 years ago now, right? These are not grown men. They was kids, yo. When I met them and I started fucking with them, they was kids trying to figure their way out to stop from busting their guns, to stop from going to jail, to stop from doing drugs, to stop from having beef with other parts of Queens, from stopping doing all of this shit. This was their whole music career and everything was all about. This was what it's about. And I don't like the fact that somebody can say something about a man that is not here anymore, a man that has a daughter that's still out here, a daughter that's on social media because some clown-ass nigga said so, and it makes it the gospel. So I'm glad that Madge stepped up. And I don't even get on my own platform and push another nigga's shit because I want you to listen to me. I don't push another nigga's shit. But that InfoMinds interview with Madge is so powerful to me for him talking about his brother that he could go more in depth than I ever could because that's his brother. I ran with it. The nigga was one of my best friends. His brother was one of my best friends. I'm his brother's. Randy Walker Stretch's daughter, Manisha, is my goddaughter. I'm one of her godfathers. You know who the other godfather is? Tupac, my nigga. Tupac. There's a picture that floats around the internet right now with me and Tupac. Pac got two blunts in his hand. He got a Death Row East T-shirt on. I got a Versace shirt on and a Kango and, and a cigar in my hand. And we're both, he's looking at the camera and I'm smiling at the camera. And we took that picture after the MTV Video Music Awards right after I cussed his ass out for not coming to Stretcher's funeral. Because that's how much that nigga loved him. But when you dazed and confused and you young, you say shit and you make rash decisions and when you get older, you look back on some of them decisions and be like, damn, what the fuck did I do that shit for? What the fuck did I say this shit for? What the fuck happened here? What the fuck happened there? Pac did what he was supposed to do. I will never throw no dirt on, on Pac. Niggas hit me, I was jealous. What the fuck did I have to be jealous of, dog? Pac was making sometimes $15,000 a show when he had a show. Every now and then. Before, Pac wasn't getting money like that before Suge got him out of jail. Dude, I was there, my nigga. I was making a million and a half a year at that time. Pac wasn't caking like I was caking, nigga. Well, I used to pick these niggas up in my bins. He was riding around and stretch his MPV. I had a bins. What, was I, what did I have to be jealous for? I was on TV every fucking day 
I'm doing. I'm overseas. I'm doing way more appearances than what he was doing at the time. But we was together because we were friends from the time that nigga was a roadie through Jews, through everything else. That was my man. Stretch was my man. And I'm telling y'all, there's no way on God's green earth that anybody can convince me. Even if you came with an audio tape, I would say that you doctored that because I knew who Randy Stretch Walker was. He was not that dude. He had no reason to be. That's the nigga that held Tupac down in New York. That's the nigga that had the respect. That's the nigga. Y'all wasn't even on, on Pac's first album. Y'all, the general public was not on Duke like that yet, yo. It wasn't like that, dog. The niggas was not on Pac like that off that first album. When Holler If You Hear Me and all that shit came out, he, would, he didn't have that fan base that he had later on in his life before he passed away. He ain't have that fan base. There's no, pictures out there with me and him holding cardboard, cut us off ourselves. We're down here in Atlanta, where I'm broadcasting from right now, doing this podcast, at Jack the Rapper. We was walking around freely. Me, him, Stretch, Be Legit, E-40's brother, Big Sight, Mo Prime, D-Shot, E-40, other. But we walking around freely, my nigga. We was walk, nobody had security. We wasn't that big. Now, after Juice came out and we came back to Atlanta, it was out of control because he played Bishop. It's a huge fucking movie. It's a huge career boost for Tupac. But before that, dog, when we was down here, Jack the Rapper, Snoop, and all of them niggas was way bigger than Tupac, dog. Way bigger than Tupac. Way, way. After Juice, he got the crib down here. He set his moms up. Y'all know the story, blah, 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 blah. That's when the nigga couldn't go to the mall. That's when the nigga was doing what he was doing. That's what the nigga was doing. But he wasn't doing that back then, bro, because he wasn't, he was still on the rise. After he got with Shug, Tupac became a, even after when Brenda got a baby, y'all wasn't even on him like that. I was there. When I get around, he just started bubbling crazy. He really bubbled crazy after he got locked up. <coughs> Shug got him out. He went to the West Coast, and he was bombing on everybody that he thought was an enemy. But he made some mistakes. He, he's only human. He made some mistakes. You can't take what I said at 25 years old and then say, I meant that shit now that I'm a grown-ass man. It's two different people, bro. Sisters, listening, it's two different people. They were all young. They didn't know they ass from their elbow. I'm 10 years older than them dudes now. I guarantee you, Pac was what, 20, what, he was 24 when he passed away? 24, 25? Would he be in his late 40s right now? Guarantee he would not be the same man. He'd probably be the biggest damn movie star we ever seen in our life because the dude had natural ability, like something that I've never seen. I've seen people have to work at what he knew how to do when it came to doing movies and, and stuff like that. He had probably been in the front of Black Lives Matter. He probably been on, on the front lines of every black, black man that got killed by the police. I know he would have had something to say about the Trayvon Martin, Freddie Gray, Eric Gardner, who I just found out is my cousin, didn't know it at the time. Eric Gardner, he would have had something to say about that. That's not the same throw my middle fingers up, fuck the world, and fuck all of this shit dude that he was at 24 or 25. You become a different man. Jay-Z is not the same person. Ed Lover is not the same person. All of these guys, Nas is not the same person. Nas is not sneaking the Uzi on the island in his army jacket line. And Nas trimmed down that mob of wild niggas that used to run with. Y'all listen to one of my favorite podcasts, and I'm a, I'm a podcaster, uh, Nori shit, Drink Champs. I told you, I, don't, I keep it 100. I don't shout out another nigga shit, but I love Nori. I've known Nori for a long time. I knew Nori when Nori would bust his fucking gun in a minute. He's not that same dude. He, he's managed to reinvent himself. He has one of the hottest podcasts and TV shows out at the same time. Nori is not that, that, that same motherfucking dude. So how do you expect that you're going to take something that a man said 
and 25 years later think it means the same thing. We don't know what would have happened. We don't know if him and Big would have gotten in a room and was like, yo, dog, niggas put me on to what happened, how I seasoned them, try to come out the elevator. When Pac got mad, he didn't give a fuck. I was right there, even if he was wrong. And a million times I told a nigga he was wrong. Even if he was wrong, the nigga didn't give a fuck. I remember one time we was down here for Jack the Rapper. We was up on the fucking roof at one of them parties. Niggas is smoking mad weed. And I could never smoke with them because them niggas smoke weed like, like, you know, like you lighting a cigarette. Like, niggas is just weed after weed after blunt after blunt after blunt. If I hit a half a blunt with them niggas, I was blitzed, and that was the end of it. It was like fucking smoking weed with Snoop, which I don't recommend anybody ever do in their lifetime. And I tried it, and it just fucking didn't work out. My whole left side was numb. I didn't know what the fuck was going on. We had the rooftop. Roof party. I can't even remember the record label. And this is before 94. All of us. Stretch, Madge, me. Low, Hamo, all of us, uh, Big Psych, rest in peace, Mo Prime, all of us on 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 the rooftop at this fucking record label party. Security guard come over there and tells us we can't can't smoke weed up here. Pac being Pac, yo motherfucker, fuck that. We doing whatever we do. I said Pac, this nigga gonna call the cops, man. Hey, fuck that motherfucker. He keep on smoking. Dude came over there again. Hey, bro. Yeah, you know, I know Pac, I like you, whatever. Y'all, you, you can't smoke weed up here. Start screaming on the nigga, calling them all kind of rent a cops, all kind of shit. I said, nigga, they about to call the cops. Now, I'm the blunt holder. I got the whole fucking box of blunts. Pac got weed, Stretch got weed, Madge got weed. Everybody had weed. So I went around and I collected, excuse me, I collected all the weed. Give me the fucking weed. Because this nigga's going to come up here and the cops are coming. Give me all of y'all weed. I took all the weed. I put it in the blunt box and went over to Nikki D. I said, Nikki D, hold this shit. Because the cops are getting ready to come up here. Cops come up. Here they, I'm like, here they come, nigga. They, all of us getting searched. Pac had a half a blunt in his pocket. They carted his ass off. Carted him off. Madge got carted off. I had to go down and get bail both of these dumb motherfuckers out. When I told them, this is the kind of shit that Pac would do. Then he would apologize later because he knew he fucked up and I told him to chill the fuck out. But if he was on something, he was on top of it. He didn't give a fuck. He wasn't apologizing. We sat at the hotel. The nigga come holler at me and say, yo, let me get your room key. I said, what you need my room key for? You in this hotel, right? I said, yeah. He said, bitch, you won't fuck me. I said, Pac, I ain't giving you my room key so you can... Fuck my fucking sheets up on my bed, nigga. You strip them shits down and leave them on the floor when you finish fucking. I'll call room service and have them bring me some more fucking sheets, all right? All right, nigga, just give me the motherfucking room key, partner. This little nigga. Okay, here, nigga. So who you fucking? Nigga said, look over there, look at there, waiting for me by the motherfucking door. I said, don't look, nigga, don't look. Just kind of, you know, stretch and turn around and look at the shit or some shit. So I stretch out my arms like I'm tired and shit. I turn around, I look. Waiting for a nigga by the door's left eye. I'm like, oh, shit. This nigga about to knock off one of TLC. Them niggas slide out. I'm talking, drinking, having a good time. This nigga back 10 minutes later. Give me the room key back. Fuck that bitch. This nigga, she come over. Pac, I'm sorry. Fuck that shit. Get the fuck out of here. This nigga's rude motherfucker. When he, I'm telling y'all, when he's on some shit and he got it in his mind, he's, he's a revolutionary. So niggas not letting it go. Fuck that. Nah, get out of here. Fuck that shit. Fuck that shit. So I let her play that off. I ain't say nothing to it. She walk away. I wait for about a good 20 minutes. I was like, nah, nigga, what happened, my nigga? I thought you was, you fucked that quick? What the fuck, nigga? You gonna lay up in the pussy? Whatever, whatever. Nigga said, nah, man, we got upstairs, right? We all in the elevator kissing, whatever, grabbing finally. We get upstairs. Now, if you remember, this is TLC now. Remember, they used to do the little... Look like little tomboy shit. Nigga say he get upstairs, he get ass nigga, he get in the bed. So left eye says she gonna go in the bathroom real quick, take her shit off. Nigga said she came out some naughty by nature drawers on and the shit turned the fuck off. <laughs> Cause naughty trenching them had out the boxing shorts back in the days and said naughty. Nigga said, oh, come the fuck on, you wanna fuck trash, trash my nigga? Why did the nigga just got mad? <laughs> and he rolled out on her. 
<laughs> and that's just the kind of dude that he was, man. And I'm telling y'all right now, man, don't believe everything a motherfucker say to you. Don't believe all the hype. Don't believe all the bullshit. Okay? Go listen to the Info Minds joint with my man Madge and let that man tell you how much Pac was loved by that crew. How much the, the young guns would ride for this dude. How much he was loved and how nobody ever in that crew turned their back. When they did the Holler If You Hear Me joint, and Madge will tell you the story if you listen to the Info Minds joint, that he went um, with Mr. Feeney. He called Mr. Feeney Ma. We all called him Ma. He went to the premiere of the joint with Mr. Feeney. If Mr. Feeney thought Stretch had something to do with her son getting shot, why would she fuck with him? Because she knew that he didn't. He did not. And that's what I'm trying. When a nigga get locked up, they, sometimes you're doing a lot of years. You're trying to get, you ain't got no money. Your family turn your back on you. You feel like you got a story to tell. You're going to make up some shit and throw another nigga under the bus just so you can try to sell. Controversy sells. People love fucking controversy. They love good stories, true stories, and they love fucking controversy. That's what sells. So he's making up some shit on a dead man to try to sell a book on a dead man. It's like me sitting up here and saying something derogatory about Heavy D, which I never will because he's one of my best friends in the business, one of my closest friends, one of the people we stayed in touch no matter what. We are friends outside of the business. That's like me telling you some derogatory shit about Heavy D. You're going to believe it just because I said it. I can make up a scenario where I say I said I saw Hev do something. It don't make it true. Hev's not here to defend himself. Left Eye's not here to defend herself, but that's a true story. Right? There's a lot of people that are no longer with us to defend themselves. It's not fair to make up a rumor or to say something derogatory about a person that's not there to defend themselves. I knew Randy Stretch Walker. I knew Tupac Amaru Shakur. I knew who these dudes were. I was around them a lot. I saw the love that they had between them. Did they have a falling out? Were they, did they have a beef? Yeah, absolutely have a, had a beef. But I make that point to say Tupac was so young when he passed that we don't know what would became of him. We don't know what kind of person as a grown man he would have turned out to be. He didn't even live to his 30s. He didn't even live to his 40s. 50s much less 88 you know what i mean you don't know so when him and stretch really got into the beef because Pac felt that one stretch to the did more when they got back down in the studio i disagree with that stretch did an interview where he was like a motherfucker getting shot is getting shot okay freddie nichols was there freddie was a young gun freddie got shot in the stomach Nobody wants to be shot. I don't, there's not a lot of people out there, y'all, that are super motherfuckers, if you know what I mean. Like, maybe a year ago, maybe a little more than a year, I'm not sure. There was a guy who went into a Waffle House and decided he was going to shoot up the Waffle House, and he was disarmed by a black man. Everybody lauded and applauded this black man for saving so many people's lives. The dude said, I was trying to save my life. I was like, you're not going to kill me today. So when I saw that he was trying to reload the gun, that's when I made my move and ran and hit the bus through the door and hit the door with him and hit him with the door, excuse me, and the gun flew out of his hand. Well, motherfuckers start shooting and guns come out. Your first thought is self-preservation. There's not a lot of people that's going to jump up and try to wrestle a gun from a it is more than one guy that got his gun out. I I don't know, y'all. I'm not. I know me. I'm not doing that. And I was way taller than Tupac. And Stretch was taller than me. So whatever your opinion is of what you thought he should have did, he wasn't Tupac's security. He was his friend that was rolling with him. And when them guns come out, it's a whole different story. I don't know if y'all have ever been held at gunpoint before. I have. I've been robbed, held at gunpoint. When them guns come out, what you think you're going to do when you just talking, yeah, I wish, I wish they would pull some guns on me. I wish a nigga would. 
and the actual gun is in your face? Totally two different things. So when Pac went on his his rant and said, Stretch is bigger than all of us and everybody, why Stretch didn't take the gun from the guy because there was more than one person that had a gun? It's number one. And number two, Stretch ain't want to get shot. He ended up getting shot and killed. You know, a year to the to the day of the robbery, so-called robbery, in the studios in Manhattan. So did they have a discrepancy? Yeah, because Pac felt like Cats wasn't holding him down when he was locked up. Cats wasn't coming up there to see him. But if you listen to the Info Minds uh, interview with Stretch's brother Madge, you'll see that E Money Bads, God rest his soul, and them did go up to the to the jail to visit Pac and did make sure Pac had money and did make sure that Pac was getting weed while he was locked up. The reason why Stretch never came up there is because he had no ID. I used to roll with Stretch in his, in his MPV. He didn't have a driver's license. He didn't have a passport. He didn't have anything, y'all. So was there a discrepancy between them two? Yeah. Did they both die be, without resolving the discrepancy? Yeah, Stretch died first. Stretch died in 95, Pac 96, Biggie 97. Three years in a row of, of tragedy, as far as I'm concerned, personal tragedy with three people that I love dearly. Pac and Stretch I knew better than I knew Big. I would see Big from time to time, and there was other certain things that would, would go along with that. You know, Big was more of an associate. We did a record together. You know, he jumped on on the uh, Back Up Off Me album on a song called Who's the Man, produced by Mark the 45 King. It's uh, King Just, myself, rhyming on there, Todd Warren, and Biggie. So I appreciated that. And Big was my man. I used to see him. When I used to go out with Lee Lee from SWV, yeah, uh, me and Lee Lee from SWV were an item. I um, Sometimes when she was out on tour, if I'd be at her crib, Big lived in the same complex. So Big, I would see Big sometime pass her through, or maybe I'd be at the mailbox. And uh, I remember one time I was at the mailbox picking up the mail from Lily, bringing the mail back into the crib, and somebody rolled up on me, and uh, I heard all I heard was "Aggie so wicked the news." I heard. I turned around, I said, "Big uh, little sucker for love ass nigga picking up her mail," because they lived in the same complex. So Big was my guy like that. But Stretch and Pac, I was around them more. Then I was around Big because, like I said in a previous podcast, Pac used to come around the way a lot and hang out, or we meet up with him in whatever hotel he was staying in the city and run around. But he's been in our neighborhood a whole lot. You know, in the Ave, the, you know, you've seen the pictures. Maybe you haven't. I'll need to repost it on my gram at Ed Lover of Us. You know, maybe at Jack the Rapper in Atlanta, maybe on the Avenue. And Queens just taking pictures, just hanging out, doing things. Different phases of his life he went through. You know, one of the problems that I had with the movie that they did on Tupac is they didn't even mention the fact that he had gotten married. They act like there was only a few women in Tupac's life. Just a few. Whatever the girl, whoever the girl was that ended up getting him arrested for the sexual assault, the... um. He, you know, when he was messing with Quincy Jones's daughter and Jada Pinkett. That, that was not the truth at all. How do you jump over the fact that this man was married? How do you delete that entire phase of his life? How do you delete some of the more important stuff that, ha- that he had? He, uh, to me, Pac had different phases of his life. He had his DU phase. Then he had his Juice, New York, Stretch, Madge, Young Guns, all of them, all of that is family phase with his moms and all of that. And then he had his death row phase. And I felt like the movie concentrated too much on his death row phase than every phase and aspect of his life. He, you know, this dude was married. Nobody even said nothing like that about it in the movie. You know how they did the, uh, they did the movie on New Edition? And the New Edition story was so deep and there's so many facets 
of the story that they had to do it as a miniseries. I always felt that Tupac was such a complex person that his life story should have been a miniseries. Maybe four parts, like a four-hour miniseries put out somewhere where maybe BT, I don't know. I don't care what channel it was. Showtime, something that somebody should have did because he was too, it was too much. He was too complex, you know. Towards the end of his life, he even had a problem with Dre. It was well documented. It wasn't just Stretch and, you know, it wasn't just Nas and it just wasn't Mob Deep. He was going at Dre. Dr. Dre, who produced California Love, which was supposed to be Dre's song, and then they put Pac on it. He had a problem with Dre. You know? He had a problem with a lot of people. But he was a youngin'. Like I told y'all, Tomorrow's my birthday. If I think about who I had a problem with when I was 25, 26, it's different. And, I, and I'm quite sure that he would have been a total different person. But I can tell you one thing, that before he, before he went to death row and before he got killed, Tupac and Stretch was tight, super tight. Ultra tight. And I will vouch for each and each one of those dudes. But the truth is the truth. And just as a person listening to this podcast, you have to understand and realize that as much as we all loved Tupac, as much as we love what Tupac stood for for black people, as much as we loved the music that Tupac made, one, he died way too early for us to even get to see what kind of man that he would have been. And two, Pac was a human being. And he made mistakes. And I've made mistakes. And you've made mistakes. And Biggie made mistakes. But to take something which is a snapshot of a person's life, a snapshot, something that somebody might have said in anger and to run with it all of this time, to me, that's a problem. It's like, it's almost as like, you know, and, and the thing about, let me, let me state this before where I tell you what it's almost like. The guy who's in jail that, that wrote this stuff, that saying that stretch had Pac set up in a quad studio shooting it angers me because it's unfair because he's not here to defend himself. It's easy to chuck dirt on a coffin. Stretch is dead. Tupac is dead. I know a lot of stuff about Tupac. A lot of stuff. I was privy to a lot of things being around Tupac. That's like me sitting here on this podcast right now and saying, yeah, well, Y'all know Tupac was bisexual, right? No, he wasn't. Not at all. But it's as if I said it and he's not here to defend himself. That's not fair. You could throw dirt on anybody if they're not there to defend themselves when you're trying, when you have an ulterior motive. You know, a lot of people now, y'all, you know, the terminology is out, the receipts. So I got the receipts. Like, you know, some chick would say, yo, he was trying to fuck me and he's supposed to be married and all of that stuff. And you'd be like, I got the receipts and they will post text messages or DMS or whatever. This dude is throwing dirt, selling Randy stretches Walker's name and he's putting it out there. And immediately, because a lot of people know that I was really close with stretch. They came to me, your man's a snitch. Your man tried to set Pac up. He has no receipts. He has no tape phone calls. He has no two ways between them. No, we didn't even have cell phones. So where was this communication coming from? We had no cell phones. He has no phone records. Nobody taped the phone call between Jimmy and Stretch. Yeah, bring him here to the studio this time. We got it all set up. You have no receipts. Plus the man is gone and he can't even defend himself. So you're going on something and you're taking it for gospel with some 
somebody who's trying to sell a product is saying. That's sensationalism. It's like the Star Magazine or one of them bullshit papers you see by the checkout in the grocery when you're getting ready to when you get ready to leave and you get ready to, you know, you're more likely to pick that magazine up. You know, Elvis found alive. You know, how many of those pictures have we seen floating around the internet? Tupac is alive. But they found some dude that resembles Tupac and said, yeah, Pac is alive and well and living in Cuba and all of this. And he faked his own death to get away from Suge Knight and blah, 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 this and blah, 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 that. That stuff is going to go on until the end of time. You know, we have proof that Tupac had a love child. He's not here to defend himself. We have absolute proof that Tupac was bisexual. No, but he's not here to defend himself. And his mother's not even here to defend him. So the only people here that can defend Stretch is those of us that loved him and knew him. And if I know anything about this man who will bust his gun in a heartbeat, is that A, he had no reason to set Tupac up. B, he loved Tupac with every bone in his body. And C, the entire story is bullshit. People go their separate ways. And sometimes they come back together and sometimes they don't. People have disagreements. Sometimes they settle their disagreements. Sometimes they don't. But I know there's a young lady out there named Manisha, Manisha Walker, who is Stretch's daughter. And I know Tupac is her godfather. And I know I'm her godfather. And I know when shit went down, he didn't go in and say, yo, I'm taking the fuck out of here. Pac ain't going to be my daughter's godfather no more. No, he loved that dude. He loved that dude. Those dudes were two peas in a pod. You see one, you see the other one. Pac was part of the young guns before he got down with death row. He was a young gun. So if you missed the first podcast, you need to go back and listen to it because I was telling you, in the first podcast, that it was about to go down in New York City based on the fact that it was Pac and based on the fact that it was Stretch and based on the fact that it was Freddie Nichols that got shot. Everybody in New York City knew who the fucking Young Guns were from Queens, not the Mount Vernon Young Guns, the Queens Young Guns, including Supreme, including Haitian Jack. They knew these little young niggas was wild. They, they grown men now. They wasn't no grown men when I was running around with them. They was they were not grown men. They did a lot of shit that there's no statute of limitations on, so I can't talk about it. But being fuck boys and pussy ass niggas, they weren't. Stretch was never that. Never that. Y'all feel like because People write on Instagram and make videos and post them to YouTube that, you know, sometimes they get burnt by somebody that, that was close to them. Sometimes somebody, they could say your enemies, are, you know, your biggest hater is the one that's standing right next to you. Sometimes the person that loves you the most is also the one that's standing right next to you. As I stated before, think about what year this was. This is way before all eyes on me. This is way before Pac started getting into some real dough. Way before. At the time, I had way more money than Tupac had. Way more money. I had better car than him. Pac didn't even have a car. He didn't even really rent a car when he came to New York. Something he was impressed by what Jack and them had, and I had more than they had. I'm pushing Benzos. 92, 93, 94, 95. Brand new Benz, 100,000 off the showroom floor. I'm pushing the big dogs. They ride, they ride in my car. They stashing guns in my trunk. Pac ain't had no bread like that. He didn't get no bread really till he got with Sugar and them. After he got bailed out of jail, he started getting some bread. He, ain't, he didn't get a, a whole lot of bread like that. He didn't. I know what Pac made from doing the movie Juice. He didn't even make 20000 from that role as Bishop. Omar Epps is my man. Him and Omar, all of them got paid the same thing. It's a little over ten grand. 
We didn't have no bread like that. Me and Dre did. Who's the man? Came out in 93. Dre and I, at that time, were the highest paid first time actors in the movie. Me and Dre got paid on Who's the Man. Paid. Pac didn't have no money like that. So Stretch setting Pac up for what? Not for no drugs, because he was a drug dealer. Until he started, got, seriously got into rapping. He still had his connects on the street. He had to get, what it was Jimmy was going to get him that he couldn't get for himself. Niggas so cracked. They, them connects didn't die. They knew where, if they really was into back into selling drugs, which at that time he had left it alone to pursue music, you wouldn't have to go to Jimmy Henchman to get no drugs. So that angle is fucking bullshit. And where was the communication coming from? Listen to the Info Minds joint that Match put out because they was doing what Pac wanted to do. They were freestyling. I was doing your TV raps. I was doing this. I was doing I had more of a schedule. They could find out where I was because I was more on a schedule than when Pac hit New York or when they was in Cali or when they went to Oakland or when they was in L.A. When Loud Squad was coming out and we did the party in L.A., when Dre beat up D from Pump It Up was at No Faces Party in L.A. Whole nother story. I get into that on another podcast. But this is before Pac was with Death Row. This is before that. He was up here, up top in New York, often and a lot. A lot. Cats did not move on Pac because Pac was with the fucking Young Guns. Cats knew that. I think a lot of cats didn't move on me in New York because they knew who my motherfucking crew was. Live Squad, Young Guns. They knew who these little young wild niggas was. They grown men now. Thank God they grew out of it. They became fathers with families and stuff like that. They still do their music thing. Madge is still holding the Live Squad name, Thugger Dons, all of that. He's still holding it down. But they knew who they was, and they was they knew who Stretch was. Niggas in New York that was in the streets knew who Stretch from Queens was. There's no doubt about it. And they knew that they was not to be fucked with. Why, why wouldn't he set me up? I had Rolexes. I had the cars. I had bread. Why he didn't do it to me? I had more bread than, than Tupac had and more jewelry. When Stretch died, that big ass Gucci link chain, big ass Gucci. I mean, major Gucci links. That was my chain. And I used to loan it to him so much that when he died, I was just like, you know what? You know, his baby mom's, Manessa called me and said, hey, what do you want me to do with your chain? I said, let, let it lay on him when he's in the casket. Let him, let him be buried with it. He loved that fucking chain. Let him be buried with it. I had other jewelry. I had the Yom TV rights piece, the bubble, with diamonds in the MTV. If you're going to set somebody up for a robbery, why not me? I had more money. He was next to me all the fucking time. If you're trying to get paid to set somebody up for a robbery, why wouldn't you set me up? Them niggas could have hit me anytime I was going to do Yom TV rights. Why, why Tupac? Y'all don't understand who are listening to these lies what it was like in 94, where we was at in 94, where Tupac was financially in 94. There was no benefit to turning on your friend. There was nothing that he could benefit from it. We had e-money bags who were still in the streets. Why do we need to go if, if, if that was something that he wanted to do? I wasn't drug dealing. I was on MTV and shit. But if that was something that he needed to do, why do you? Why the fuck would we have to go to a Brooklyn nigga to get it? Niggas in Queens been getting money. Prem and them, Fat Cat, Corley and them, Ben, me and them, Tommy Mickens and them, been getting money. Why do we have to? Why would he have to go to a Brooklyn nigga to get money? He used to laugh at Queens niggas. 
oh, y'all in the two-fair zone. You got to take the bus or the train to get out there where y'all live, blah, 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 until they find out niggas was getting money in Queens. Stretching them was getting money in Queens. I don't even know who they connect was, but they was getting money in Queens. Ja Rule was in them was out there. Ja was out there on Hempstead in Springfield getting money. Why in God's name would we have to ever go to somebody in Brooklyn to get, wasn't like he was buying five keys and Jimmy had it for cheap. Oh, he set Tupac up for Jack. And then I'm going to give you these five keys for cheap. He wasn't even selling drugs no more. He wasn't selling drugs. These niggas went, their love of music was so, so, so immense that they left drug dealing alone where they was getting money to hustle beats. They was hustling beats like they hustled crack. They was producing for other people. They was doing tracks for Tupac. Why are you going to bite the hand that feeds you? What fucking sense does that make? For an eight ball of, of, of Coke that you could get anywhere? We knew niggas up in the Heights. If we wanted an eight ball of Coke, niggas would front it. In Washington Heights, New York, Dominican niggas up there would front you if you knew who you knew. I'm not going to yell no names out. But we don't fucking snitch. You knew who you knew, you can get it. If I want it now, I can get it. Right now. What reason, what logical reason for anybody out there that's doubting what I'm saying to you right now? Tell me a logical reason why. For a robbery, when we knew other niggas that had way more money than Tupac? Come on, B. This shit even sounds ridiculous. What's the logical reasoning behind it? Because Stretch certainly didn't die with no money. Still driving an MPV. What's the logical reasoning behind that? Oh, and then the other bullshit. Uh, dude sent some dude from California to kill Stretch because of the setup of Tupac in a quad studio. Stretch got killed on some Queens beef, yo. He was killed on some Queens beef. We don't snitch, so we ain't going to say who. We know who. Niggas got handled behind it, and it was some Queens beef. It had nothing to do with what happened in the quad studio. It just so happened that he got killed a year to the day of the quad shooting. That was some whole different shit. Stop believing from all of these things that anybody says man and motherfuckers came at me strong to the point where I was blocking people and I was I found myself getting into arguments with people behind it on social media and then I just stopped I said you know what they won there a lot of people that was coming at me about this weren't even born in 94 or they were 3 or 4 years old they learned about Tupac through his music didn't know dude personally at all just going by with the last couple of things that Pac said when he spit out when he was angry. And they just they just take that shit and roll with it. You know? But like I told you before, and I'm gonna keep saying this, one thing you gotta realize, Pac is not Jesus Christ, nor was he God. He was a man that made mistakes. He made mistakes. Everybody made mistakes. Randy Stretch Walker made mistakes, but one mistake he didn't make. He ain't have no Tupac set up in the quad studios. It's bullshit. That's bullshit. That was Jack, and that was Jimmy. And that's who it was. This dude talking sideways about some shit. He, he don't even know nothing about it, man. He don't even know nothing about it. You know? And it causes a whirlwind of feelings old anger and old feelings. It just stirs up a lot of emotion that don't need to be stirred up. What we need to be thinking about and hoping for is redemption for everybody through the eyes of our God and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For everybody that made mis- that makes mistakes. God loves you so much that he forgives every time you make a mistake. And that's the beautiful part of it. 
that you can make mistakes in life and then you grow and you learn. If you don't learn and grow from your mistakes, then you'll remain stagnant for the rest of your entire life. And nobody wants to be stagnant. That's for sure. It's funny. I've seen a dude, um, like I told y'all earlier in this podcast, my best friend lost his dad. So I was up in New York for the funeral. So we go to breakfast and they're sitting at a table is uh, one of my friends from Hollis, Queens, named Kenny Bang. When we was kids, Kenny used to terrorize the neighborhood. Everybody knew Kenny Bang. He wasn't called Kenny Bang. He didn't get Bang for no reason. And I see him sitting there, man, and I'm talking to him, and we reminiscing over all time, old times and of all the times that we spent together. But reminiscing, he's such calm collected. He's in his 50s now. We went to junior high school together or middle school, as some people call it. And just to watch his transformation from being a wild boy to where he is now as a grown man, I can say I was very, very proud of him. I never got to see that with Pac. I never got to see Pac's transformation. I never got to see Stretch's transformation. He was 28 when he died. I never got to see Biggie's transformation. What they would have been like in their 40s. Who would they have been as men right now? Would they have put let bygones be bygones and put their past in the past and realize by this time, 20 some odd years later, where that whole shit came from and how that shit divided them and how it affected both, both coasts and how just off he said, she said, and rumors and innuendos, we lost two of the greatest MCs that ever graced the microphone in hip hop. Who would they be right now? Would Biggie have fulfilled his dream of managing Puff, putting a commission together with Jay-Z and Charlie Baltimore, helping unrun Undeus Entertainment, expanding into his clothing line, being as big as bigger than Jay-Z or having his own label with C's and Kim and all of that? Would C's and Kim even be fucking with each other if Biggie was alive? With the whole shit that sent D-Rock and them to prison outside of Hot 97 in New York with the shooting, would that have even occurred if Biggie was alive? How about Tupac? We had done Thug Life records through Jimmy Iovine? Would he be on the front lines of the everything that has to do with the police shooting young black men in America? What kind of 40-something-year-old man would Tupac Pac have been? Would he have kept been making records? Would he have been just doing movies? He had the natural knack. He's one of the greatest natural actors I've ever seen in my life, especially for somebody who just went to high school for a little while for performing arts. He was a hell of a poet. He was natural. How would music be? Well, we have the trap era that we have. If them two would have still been around making music. What would have happened? Would Death Row still be bubbling? Would Bad Boy be bubbling as hard as, as hard as ever? We'll never know. Because losing them two had a lot of effect on the music world and the world in general. Losing them three, I should say. Because although Stretch did not become as famous as Biggie or Tupac, he still had a major impact on a lot of successful records out there. Would another label have picked up the live squad? We don't know. Because he cut that head and the body just fell. We don't know. Squad broke up. After Stretch died. We don't know. What would have happened with the outlaws? Would he assign more people the Thug Life Records. He was going to sign Live Squad. The Thug Life Records. What happened with Big and, and everything that Big wanted to do? More stuff with Charlie Baltimore, maybe. More stuff with Kim, maybe. You know? You know, would the best of both worlds ever existed? You know, I hate to talk about R. Kelly. He's such a creep. But would Biggie have done the best of both worlds with R. Kelly instead of Jay-Z? Would Jay-Z have been as big? as he managed to be. He's a dope MC, but at that time, Biggie was a lot bigger than Jay-Z. Remember, Jay-Z didn't drop Reasonable Doubt 
until 96. His first album that he said we all lamed out on came out in 1996. 96. Big died in 97. Big died before he could even shoot more videos off the Life After Death album, which he had. Joints, remember when they did the video for Sky's the Limit, they used the little kid instead of Big. Pac, all eyes on me. How many more videos could Pac have done? Where is there room? Where is there, is there room for X, DMX? Is there room for Ja Rule? Remember when the can of get a video, Ja Rule had the bandana tied around his head like Pac. Would he squash all beefs or would the beefs continue? We never know. So you can't make up shit because you don't know. You can't lie about shit because you don't know what would have happened. Did they have beef? Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't beef, beef enough to where they was going to the guns at each other when they saw each other. Wasn't that kind of beef. I would just really believe in my heart. And I know in my heart that them two guys really, really loved each other. And I really believe, especially Pac and Stretch, that they would have came to something and talked and everything would have been good. But Stretch died before they could even get to that. They only lived a solid year after the quad shooting. And when Pac got with, with Death Row, he didn't even live a year. He didn't live one year from the time Shug got him out to making all of that music, he didn't live an entire year. Not one. It is still absolutely amazing to me that officially both, all three of these murders are unsolved. Officially. Police has never arrested anybody for Tupac's murder. Never arrested anybody for Biggie's murder and never arrested anybody for Randy Stretch Walker's murder. They died in three years back to back. 95, 96, 97. And nobody has ever been arrested. Here we are, 2019, and people who are not even around, not part of the industry, not even affiliated in those days, or talking about dead people like they know. Talking about dead people. First, it was Biggie set them up. Remember that? Remember y'all was on that? The people was on that. Biggie did that. Biggie, Biggie deserved to get killed because what he did to Tupac. Now, it ain't Biggie no more. It's stretched now. So Biggie couldn't defend himself. So everybody that loved Big Puff, all them, D-Rock, all them had to step up and was like, Sees is like, fuck y'all talking about? Biggie's the one to put the guns in his pocket that Pac had on him and walked him past the cops. Fuck you talking about? Biggie had no idea that shit was getting ready to happen. It was up in there recording with Junior Mafia shit. So you can't fuck with Big no more because he's one of the greats. So you have to immortalize Big. So some dude that has no credibility, no receipts at all, Bring Stretch's name up like niggas had mad cell phones and pages. Like he got the pages, he got the DMs, which we ain't even do in those days. Nothing to DM because nobody was on social media. Telling you this shit and you soak it up and you reflect it on his family and you reflect it on me because I am his family. That shit to me sounds absolutely, utterly ridiculous. Re fucking ridiculous. And if you believe that dumb shit, then I got a plot of land right here on Lakefront that I'll sell to you for cheap. Lake Shore, I mean Lake Shore Drive here in Chicago. That I, I give it to you for cheap. Because you gotta be out of your damn bird ass mind to even be buying into that, man. Nah, the brothers loved each other. Towards the end of their lives, they had problems. But at the end of the day, as everybody likes to say, at the end of the day, they loved each other. And that's the honest to God's truth. And may their souls rest in eternal peace. 
Stretch, Pac, Biggie, I'm on you till I join you. I love y'all so much, man. And I hope that this finally puts this stupid shit to rest. All right? Now, if I'm wrong, then somebody please show me concrete proof that I'm wrong. Or let me hear a taped phone call that wasn't doctored. If I'm wrong, I'll stand up and admit that I was wrong. I'll be super disappointed and stretched. But I don't think I'm wrong. I think it's a bunch of bullshit. I think when somebody's trying to sell something, they'll say anything that got their attention. All right? That's part two. There's no other part to it. Anything else you want to know, you're going to have to wait till I put the book out. And I'm not trashing nobody. I'm telling the truth. 